Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Well, I get to stand here now. (laughs) Pastor James is helping out with a rodeo this weekend. He is preaching some there and and doing all kinds of other stuff that he does. I'm sure he'll have some stories for us. Um, But I get to share. Now, I've been preaching, Will and I have been going through Acts for so long, I had to find a different passage to, to go through. And so, and actually, I did not, re- I didn't remember that it would take a bunch more extra study to get started on a new thing. So, but I was able to get it done. And I'm glad to be here. In 2003, Dan Brown wrote a book called The Da Vinci Code. If any of you heard of it? Yes. Probably, yeah. It quickly became a bestseller and sold over 80 million copies and was translated into 44 languages. It was made into a movie starring Tom Hanks and Ian McKellen, directed by Ron, Ron Howard. And that, that makes me sad. Yeah. Although it's a work of fiction, Brown presented it as a carefully researched mix of fact and fiction. In truth, it was a strong attack against Christ and his church. It caused an uproar in the Christian community. Many people, both non-Christians and Christians, were deceived into believing that the facts Brown stated were true. A number of books and articles were written to refute the baseless facts the book contained. In 2006, my pastor asked me to do some research to write a paper and give a presentation to help people understand what was behind the book the historical truth it denies, and how to engage with its many fans. So just for fun, uh, here's a little trailer that I made uh, for that presentation. These little things that are appearing on the bottom there are just anagrams mixing up of the words the Da Vinci Code, because you can, if you do that kind of thing, you can make stuff say whatever you want. <laughs> That's Dan Brown. It's not tonight at 6 p.m., so don't don't come back then. You'll find something different. Anyway, um, today I'm just gonna point out a couple aspects of the Da Vinci Code's deceptions. The first is that the book claims that no one thought of Jesus as divine until sometime in the fourth century. And that even then, it was the idea of the Roman emperor Constantine. Before that, it says, he was just considered a prophet. But the truth is that we've always, Christians have always known that Jesus Christ is God. Both Old and New Testaments assert that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is God in the flesh, God's son. And we'll see some of those verses here in a bit. The second lie, a second lie that the book puts forth is that the original Christianity was something called Gnosticism. Gnosticism teaches that all physical matter is evil and only the spirit is good. It rejects most of the Bible and says that man's problem is that he's ignorant, which that part's not so wrong, <laughs> but that's not all. And, but only by special secret knowledge, that's the gnosis part, uh, can he be saved. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are irrelevant, it teaches. We'll also look at some verses that address this unbiblical worldview that the false teachers long ago were talking about. The Da Vinci Code presents many other lies as truth, among them that Jesus married Mary Magdalene, who was a goddess, by the way, it says. They had children, and according to Brown and his sources, She is the Holy Grail, and her identity is protected by a secret society. This is all bogus. Secrets are hidden in Leonardo da Vinci's paintings. That's where the novel's name comes from, the Da Vinci Code. The book is a classic example of postmodernism, which rejects the idea of absolute truth. 
to postmodernists like Brown, the winners write history and define the truth. We believe otherwise. Let's pray. Father, speak through me, use me, use your word through me by your Holy Spirit today to speak the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're looking at 1 John. Um, who wrote John? Who wrote the first John? Well, we call it the first letter of John. Most likely it was written by John, Jesus' disciple, one of the apostles who also wrote the Gospel of John, second and third letters of John, and the Revelation to John. But he never says his name in the text itself. That's why we're, we're pretty sure who it was. But it's not like Paul's letters where he says, and who did he write it to? Even though it doesn't have the usual opening and closing of other letters in the New Testament, it was probably written to Christian churches that John knew with the intention of it being passed on from one church to another. That's what's called an encyclical letter. Where and when did he write it? John probably wrote the letter sometime after 80 AD, 80 AD, uh, from the city of Ephesus in modern Southwest Turkey. I don't have a map today, so you have to just imagine that. Why did he write it? John had several reasons for writing this letter, and he states three of them that we're going we're gonna to see some of them as we go through. But for his own joy, he wrote it, to encourage believers not to sin, to assure believers of their eternal life. And we're going to see other reasons too. Most commentators also believe that John was addressing anti-Christian ideas that false teachers were promoting. We'll look at some of these as we come to them in the text. The structure of the letter is not easy to break, break up into a nice outline. It's been described as a spiral, so I won't try to make it into, fit into some nice sermon box. What the letter says is extremely practical and packed with truth. These first three verses that we're going to look at are all one long sentence, so, so we'll break it up into chunks. And um, you're going to hear a lot of cross-references today because with the point, my point would be that showing that the truth John is presenting here are not special to John, but are found throughout the Bible. <clears throat> so beginning with John 1.1 1, 1 there, what was from the beginning? It, that already reminds me of how John starts his gospel in John 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Clearly, he's talking about Jesus, who was there at creation. Again, in John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. He's been around since the beginning. <laughs> Just... So the rest of verse 1 here, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. All these, all these we pronouns are referring to John and the other disciples who were with Jesus while he was living on earth. They heard what he said, they saw what he did, they watched how he interacted with people and worked alongside him. The point is that John's message is based on a historical reality. He, he was an eyewitness. And at the end it says uh, the word of life. And what's that? Well, that's Jesus. <laughs> 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And Luke 24.39, the resurrected Jesus is speaking. He says, See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. One advantage that I have in studying the original Greek of the New Testament is that it's easier to see some nuances that are, get lost, can easily get lost in translation. For instance, where it says what we have heard and what we have seen, these verbs are, are what, in, uh, what is called the perfect tense, which means that they describe something that was completed in the past but has ongoing effects. And the emphasis is on the 
on, on what's different now because of it. In other words, what the apostles heard and saw changed their lives and our lives too. Verse 2, and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So this whole, this whole second verse is kind of a parenthesis in the middle. And the, the version that I'm using here uses the word manifested, which isn't a word that I use too often. But it means to be made known, to be shown, to be revealed. The life was revealed and, uh, and was, was revealed to us. And again, the life, the eternal life. Who, who or what is the eternal life? Of course, it's Jesus. 1 John 5, 11 and 12, a little later in this letter, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. John 14, 36, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. In John 17, 3, Jesus is praying for his disciples, this is eternal life, that they may know you, God, the one, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Second Timothy 1.10, Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, so that's the end of the parenthesis. We'll go back to the thought of, the, of verse 1. What we have seen, verse John 3, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. It's the same uh, kind of thing that Peter's saying in Acts 4.20, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. There's an important word in here. It's repeated. Fellowship. It's the Greek word koinonia, which you might have heard of. It means a close association involving mutual interest in sharing, communion, fellowship, close relationship. Or it's the attitude of goodwill that shows an interest in a close relationship, like generosity, altruism, sharing, participation. It refers to the life of the, the believers share with Christ and with one another. It's one of the things that is happening when we're sharing communion, which we're, or the Lord's Supper that we're going to do in a little bit. In fact, it's what we're doing here now in this place, worshiping and learning together. John 14, 20, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, in that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. In John 17, 21, Jesus is praying for his disciples. He says that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. In 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son. Jesus Christ our Lord. And finally, in the introduction here, verse 4, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. So writing this letter brought John joy, as is usually the case when we're exercising our spiritual gift for God's glory. John 15, 9 through 11, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. So that's the end of the, these first four verses are kind of the introduction. Now we're going to get to verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. He says, God is light. 
And then he makes it even stronger by saying emphatically, there's no darkness in him at all. So what does he mean by light and darkness? Well, it's a metaphor used in a lot of places in God's word. Light is righteousness, holiness, love, goodness, and truth. Darkness is the opposite, or absence of light, unrighteousness, sin, hate, evil, and lies. In other words, God is totally righteous, holy, loving, good, and true, without exception. There is no unrighteousness, sin, hatred of people, evil, or lies in him at all. With God, there is no twilight zone. Psalm 5.4, for you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? John 1.4, in him, in Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. John 18, John, sorry, John 8.12, then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So now the next five verses after this all have the form, if we do something, then there's a result. And they're all based on the fact that God is light. Also, when it uses the pronoun we, it's meant to be inclusive, meaning that it applies to the readers as well as the writer. That it means it's us. It means it applies to us. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. This first statement is negative and is probably addressing something that the false teachers were doing. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, Stop there. We've talked about what it means to have fellowship with God, but what does it mean to walk in the darkness? Uh, it's a Hebrew expression that we see throughout the Bible, meaning to pursue a way of life that's sinful and evil. 1 John 4.20 If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Matthew 7, 22 and 23, Jesus is speaking. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. In John 3, 19 to 21, Jesus is speaking again. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as, as shown as having been wrought in God. So going back to the verse there, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. I like the word practice here. It makes me think of how we practice music or sports. Sometimes we make mistakes, but the more we practice, the better we get at living in the light. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, stop there, one of the functions I had at my previous church was to design and implement stage lighting for the worship team or the speaker or the dramas the church would put on. I think Chuck stood in some of my lights. <laughs> I would make sure that the lights were aimed at the place where the speaker speaking or singing or other action was taking place. But if the speaker or singer stood in a different place, not in the light, no one would see them. My point is that although God is light, it's up to us to walk or live in his light. Otherwise, we're walking in darkness, living in darkness. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
Fellowship with other Christians is part, an important part, of walking in the light. And so is being made clean by Jesus' atoning sacrifice, by his paying our penalty. And like Pastor James like to ask, likes to ask, how much is all sin? Yeah, how much? Yeah. <laughs> and all means more than we might think at first glance. It includes all our sins before we came, became believers, all the sins we've sinned since we've become Christians, right up to this moment, and all the sins we will sin in the future until we go to be with Him in, in heaven. That's a lot of sins He's paid for. John 1.29 says, The next day he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Such were some of you, bad guys, but you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. In Ephesians 1.7 in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Verse 8, if we, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So here's another thing that the false teachers were saying. We don't sin or our sins don't matter. People say it today. But the truth is that we do have a sin nature and we are not naturally good. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Isaiah 53.6 All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And a short sweet one in Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But when we do sin, how can we get back in fellowship with God, in whom there's no darkness, no sin at all? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is one of the first verses I memorized as a Christian. The word confess is a, the Greek word homologeo, which means to concede that something is factual or true, to admit, to acknowledge, with focus on admission of wrongdoing. It means to agree with God about what we know to be true and how we've fallen short. I get the opportunity to do this many times a day, <laughs> even if it looks like I never make mistakes. <laughs> God knows my heart. But he is faithful and true to his promise. He always forgives my sins, and he will yours too. It's a promise right here. Even, this even works for sins we're not aware of, because those count too. He's not showing favoritism or partiality here. That's the righteous part. He forgives our sins because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. This is one of the things that we commonly do before our communion or the Lord's Supper, to confess and ask God to forgive our sins. But the idea is that this would be something we do on a daily, hourly, and moment-by-moment -moment basis, as often as the Holy Spirit prompts. And the result is that He makes us clean from all unrighteousness. How much is all unrighteousness? <laughs> yeah, it's really all. There's no sin left over. Any guilt that's left over is our own doing. Psalm 32, 5. I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And finally, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Here's a third thing the false teachers were claiming. I have never sinned. Well, that's just goofy. <laughs> Besides the verses I've mentioned already, we have a very well-known saying, no one is perfect. If I think I'm perfect, I'm saying that God's word is not true and I'm making myself God. Anyone who believes this does not understand or believe the gospel. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk in the darkness. I've done it. It's scary and lonely and you stumble and fall. I don't want to live in the twilight zone. It's not where you or I were created to be. But it's really not that hard to get out of the darkness and live in the light. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're going to sing a song here in a minute. And here's a, kind of a paraphrase. Be my vision, O Lord of my heart. Everything else is nothing to me besides you. You are my best thought anytime, whether I'm awake or asleep. You are my light. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your, your love, your truth, um, the fellowship we can have with you, the light, the fact that you are light and in you is no darkness at all. I thank you for your forgiveness and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.